dividing of the night of the 15th that the word of the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Mizraim, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who would have sat upon the throne of his kingdom, unto the firstborn sons of the kings who were captives in the dungeons as hostages under Pharaoh's hand, and who, for having rejoiced at the servitude of Israel, were punished as the Mizraim, and all the firstborn of the cattle that did the work of the Mizraim died they also. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, San Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. I thank again all of you for taking the time to join me this evening. I have a very interesting show lined up for you and this will be the first of what will probably be three four episodes and i'm gonna try to do them in a row but i'm not promising that will happen but it is something that many of you have asked me to bring forth in the work that I've done. I've done numerous shows previously where I have shown to you that in the Aramaic translations of, for instance, the Targum of Psalms and also the Targum of Isaiah, that there has been an organized effort by the translators who turn the Hebrew and the Aramaic into the Greek and then the Greek into the modern English to specifically remove the allusion to the word of the Lord from the ancient scriptures. And the passage that I just read is a, another one of the examples of what has now become a, a forgotten and forbidden and hidden theme that even the contemporary belief that the Jewish people or the Hebrew, the Israelites, the people of Yasharel, that they did not believe in Yahushua as the Savior Messiah, that really is actually a lie. That when you begin to study the ancient manuscripts and to examine in very thorough manner even the commentaries and the um, books that were passed down through and by the patriarchs and that were even dictated to Moshe and that became the first five books of the Pentateuch, they without a doubt show that the Israelites and the elder patriarchs and the prophets of old, not only did they know Yahushua as the Son of God and as the Logos, the word, the Memra of the Most High God. But they knew him to be what would be the future Savior Messiah, that he would enter into flesh form at a specific time and that he would do so in order to redeem their bloodline and their seed from their being placed under the authority of death and cast from paradise in what is a fallen form and a fallen state of being. And this becomes absolutely clear when you study even just the accounts of the ancient prophecies as they are associated to the fulfillment of Christ as the Lamb that would take away the sins of the world. 
And because so few really study the Targum or examine it in the manner that we do, myself and my children and also those that gather together with us on Saturdays for the Digital Book Readers Club, we did a 40-plus week chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse examination of the books from Genesis all the way through Exodus, the story of Exodus and the freedom that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in leading Abraham's seed through Moshe, who was a type and a shadow of Christ as Savior and Messiah, that we covered in great detail many of the passages which I will speak about this evening to bring clarity to this particular topic and to help you understand that there's no accidental mistranslation of these particular passages that there had to have been an organized, yes, conspiracy, an organized effort to taint the manuscripts and to remove Christ as the Logos, the Word of the Lord, the Son, from relationship with not only the ancient patriarchs, but Israel as nation once they come to be a chosen people under Yahweh. And so for those that do not know what I'm talking about that may be interested in learning more, you can just search the word of the Lord removed from translation uh, in YouTube and you should find the shows that I've done on this topic. And I, as I stated previously, I've gone all the way through Psalms and shown how there are numerous, really, I don't remember the exact number, but in the case of the first five books of the Pentateuch, you see in the Aramaic that there are 217, 217 allusions to the word of the Lord. But in the English translation, the King James Version of the Bible, when you search out the manuscripts for the phrase, the word of the Lord, you will find that there are only five translations of this phrase in the modern English, in the King James Version of the Bible. And so there are 200 and six changes where Christ has been removed out of the scriptures. And so tonight I'm going to give you examples of that. And I'm not sure how much I will be able to get through, but I do have 50 listed here that I'll share with you. And I tried to be brief um, in covering just, you know, within a few sentences before and after to share with you the context of what should have been translated as word of the Lord and what has largely been only translated as Lord. And so they are attributing what should be connected to the Son to the Father and have removed Christ from the Scriptures completely. And I know that the ancient rabbis, they were attempting to 
portray that the Israelites only believed in Yahuwah, only worshipped one God, the Father. When in truth, they, like modern Christians do now, they revered the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was and is the feminine aspect of the Godhead. And I know that a lot of people condemn me just for saying this. And yet, you know, again, when you examine the ancient manuscripts and you read, like even the Great Commission series uh, that we've gone through in great detail the past few weeks, you see that even in the Great Commission that Christ told the apostles to go forth to teach the gospel to the ends of the world and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the same way that John says, there are three that bear witness in the heavens, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so, Israel, the patriarchs of old, the prophets of old, Adam, Abraham, Enoch, uh, Noah, all of the ancient patriarchs revered the Holy Trinity. And this has been hidden. This has been covered over and has been for whatever reason misconstrued and so it's part of the focus of my work to restore the balance of this worship and reverence for the the holy trinity the the one true godhead they that pre-existed before all other things became and they who were the ones responsible for the manifestation of all things even unto humanity male and female created he them and so I'm trying to help people to understand truth and to bring you back to what was the original faith because there is only one faith the truth is that those who knew and understood truth worshipped the Godhead in the form of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit because they are the only real true existent Godhead. All of the other false pagan cultures, civilizations, and the reverence of a pantheon of gods and goddesses, those are idolatrous because those people and those cultures have been led astray by legion to divert worship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and to give it to the fallen angels, those who are nothing more than the angels that the Most High cast out of the heavens long ago and that Lucifer, Satan the adversary, that his effort in working and creating and pushing the agenda of the New World Order has been to lead the world astray and to divert worship to himself in wanting to be like the Most High. And so I'm here to help you to understand the underlying truth which connects all things. And so tonight will be 
part of that continuing effort. And, uh, you know, I thank everybody for tuning in and, and opening yourself to new possibility. I know this will be a very new topic for a lot of you and that, um, I'm not able to log into the Discord chat and to follow along with all of you and to receive your questions. My children are monitoring uh, that, but if I do so, it distorts my sound. And so that's the reason why I am uh, mostly disconnected from chat. All right, so we're going to go to the very beginning. I wanted to share with you first the instances that are found in the King James where the word of the Lord is still mentioned. You see that In Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 and 4, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Remember the passage that we find in Matthew where Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. Well, there's still hints of this in the King James and Genesis 15 is connection to that. But what you will discover when we get into the Targum and the original Aramaic is that the word of the Lord, Christ, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, that not only was he interactive with Abram, he was interactive with Isaac, Jacob, um, and all of the other patriarchs of the 12 tribes and going all the way back to Noah, Enoch, Adam, and the 10 generations. I mean, immediately, even from the banishment of Adam from paradise, you will see his presence and his guidance and directing the ancient Israelites. Okay. Uh, Before we move on, I I do want to let people know that Nighthawk, Mike Ringley, who was the organizer, the creator, and the establishment of Revolution Radio as platform that he has passed on and now has gone on to be with the Lord. And so I do ask people to pray for he and his family. And um, I just want to thank you, Nighthawk, for all that you have done for all the hosts here and in organizing this, the structure of this channel to bring forth truth. And even within, you know, I've been on the, this radio network for several years now. Um, that it's been an awesome experience being with all the various hosts. 
And uh, I know that he gave his heart and his mind to making Revolution Radio a success. And so just a, you know, a moment of recognition and thanksgiving to Nighthawk for all that he has done for all of us. We appreciate and love you, brother, and wish you well. And I uh, look forward to that time when we are all together in reunion. All right. So we're going to go into it now. And as I said, I'm going to share with you first uh, a few more of the verses from the King James where you have correctly the word of the Lord found in translation. In Exodus 9, it says, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. In Numbers 3, Verse 16, and Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. In verse 51, and Moses gave the money of them that were redeemed unto Aaron and to his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. In Numbers 4, verse 45, these be those that were numbered of the families of the sons of Mary. Merari, who Moses and Aaron numbered according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. There's only a few more, so. In Numbers 22, verse 18, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Numbers 36, verse 5. And Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph that hath said well. And then finally in Deuteronomy 34, verse 5, it says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And so you see that even in the King James, we have allusions to relationships with the word of the Lord, who is Christ, the Logos, to Abraham, Balak, and also um, Moshe. So consider that and then think of what we are now about to go into. And I'm going to begin with Genesis. And as I said, I've got 50 individual accounts here. And I'm going to try to be as precise as possible to show you where the word of the Lord should be translated into the scriptures. And how it has been removed. All right. And then again, you can get confirmation of this and study this out for yourself in the Aramaic Targum and the Palestinian Targum that we have released at sacredwordpublishing.com. Now, it's easy for me to do this study because I was the one that put the manuscript together and so I can I have the document that I can search out the term word of the Lord and find exactly all 217 instances of its occurrence in the first five books of the Aramaic Targum and so I'm going to share with you a number of these verses to give you an idea as to where this 
phrase should be found in translation and how when you restore the original context, you get more understanding as to, again, the relationship of Christ with the patriarchs of the nation of Yashara. All right, beginning. And the Lord created man in his likeness in the Jerusalem Targum. And the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. In the likeness of the presence of the Lord, he created he him. The male and his yoke fellow, he created them. In the image of the Lord, he created him with 248 members, with 360 and five nerves, and overlaid them with skin and filled it with flesh and blood, male and female, in their bodies. He created them. And so this is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Which, you know, I'm not going to give you all the verses, but you'll see in familiarity, those of you that are well read in the scriptures as to where these, because the Targum is different in that there's so much more information provided and so much that has been left out of our English translations or modern English translations and even in the Greek translation of the Septuagint which is 200 years old uh, later uh, the Aramaic Targum was dated to around 4th century BC when the um, the Holy Temple was reconstructed after the diaspora uh, that began in 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar's 70 years of exile where he took the prophet Jeremiah and Daniel and the scribes Baruch and Nehemiah uh, took them as captive. And it was during their stay in Babylon that they assimilated Aramaic as what was their predominant lexicon. And then when the temple was rebuilt and they were released from the bondage of Babylon by Darius and Cyrus and allowed to return to the Holy Land and to rebuild the temple, that's when they realized that the during the devotional and the worship, they had to read the Hebrew scriptures in Aramaic to translate it into Aramaic because the the lay people did not um, have knowledge of how to understand Hebrew. It became a scholarly language that was shared only amongst the learned and the priests and the rabbis. And so that's when the Targum was authorized. And Targum just means translation. And it was created... And, you know, again, it's only the first five books of the Pentateuch because that's what they had. That's what they revered back in that time. And so when I read these verses, these passages, you'll get a sense for what they relate to, but you'll find that there's so much more information um, provided within the the Aramaic and it's because it was an untainted translation of the Hebrew Torah which we no longer have and this is the English translation of that first translation of the Hebrew Torah into a different language and in this case it was the Aramaic which again predates the Greek, as well as all modern English translations. The Aramaic Targum is 2,000 years older than the King James Version of the Bible. All right. 
the next. And a garden from the Eden of the just was planted by the word of the Lord God before the creation of the world. And he made there to dwell the man when he had created he him, when he had created him. And the Lord God made to grow from the ground every tree that was desirable to behold and good to eat and the tree of life in the midst of the garden whose height was a journey of 500 years and the tree whose fruit they who ate would distinguish between good and evil. The next passage. And of course, I could comment on all of this, but if I did, you know, we'd never really get anywhere. So unless there's just something really remarkable in the passage, I'm just going to read it and you can dwell on it. If you have questions on anything, you can certainly send them in to my daughter-in-law, Joy, at sacredwordpublishing.com and we will answer them in the Ask Me Anything Uh, shows that we do every other Friday. All right, continuing. And they heard the voice of the word of the Lord God walking in the garden in the repose of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from before the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Is not all the world which I have made manifest before me, the darkness as the light? And how hast thou thought in thine heart to hide from before me? The place where thou art concealed, do I not see? Where are the commandments that I commanded thee? Jerusalem. Walking in the garden in the strength of the day, And the word of the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Behold, the world which I have created is manifest before me. And how thinkest thou that the place in the midst whereof thou art is not revealed before me? Where is the commandment which I taught thee? And see, you know, this whole of Adam, the futility of their hiding from the Lord God, or in this case, the word of the Lord God, uh, how, you know, you can't hide from God. And these verses make that plain. Whereas in the King James, it it's almost like God doesn't know where they are. But, you know, again, in the true translation, he speaks about just the futility of their trying to hide from him which would make sense because he is all knowing all right the next to serve the law is better than to eat of the fruit of the tree of life the law which the word of the lord prepared that man in keeping it might continue and walk in the paths of the way of life in the world to come. In the Jerusalem, it says, And the word of the Lord God said, Behold, Adam, whom I have created, is soul in my world, as I am soul in the heavens above. It is to be that a great people are to arise from him, and from him will arise a people who will know how to discern between good and evil. And now it is good that we keep him from the Garden of Eden before he stretch forth his hand and take also of the fruit of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Which we know that because he is in a fallen state of being. That's why Christ, the word of the Lord God, removes Adam and banishes him from paradise. And if you follow up this story, you read in the primary Adamic literature, the first book of Adam and Eve, and others, the Testament of Adam, and so on and so forth, um, you see that Christ tells him that after five and a half days, 
that he would come and redeem him. And Adam does not understand that he's speaking of 5,500 years. And that after that amount of time, he would enter into flesh himself, be born of a virgin in order to rectify the fall. Which, if you want to know all of those prophecies, and especially about the 5,500-year prophecy, you can look to my book, The Ancient Prophecies of Christ. Next. And Adam knew his wife again at the end of 130 years, after Abel had been slain. And she bare a son and called his name Sheth. For she said, The Lord hath given me another son instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Sheth also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. That was the generation in whose days they began to err and to make themselves idols, and surnamed their idols by the name of the word of the Lord. And so they became blasphemous. Next. And the word of the Lord said, The generations which are to arise shall not be judged after the manner of the generation of the deluge, which is to be destroyed and exterminated and finally blotted out. Have I not imparted my spirit to the sons of men because they are flesh, that they may work good works? But they do works of evil. Behold, I have given them a prolongment of a hundred and twenty years, that they may work repentance, but they have not done it. And so, you know, this is Christ, the word of the Lord, speaking about giving man reprieve during what was the hundred and twenty years leading up to the flood of Noah's day. And this was why... Noah was building the ark and then, you know, not working repentance, then the word of the Lord Christ brought flood upon the world. Oh, here's continuation of that passage. And they entered to Noah in, and they entered to Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, in which was the breath of life and they coming entered male and female of all flesh unto him as the Lord had instructed him and the word of the Lord covered over the door of the ark upon the face thereof Jerusalem and the word of the Lord was merciful upon him and so it was Christ who closed the door of the ark and sealed Noah within and so you know again you don't find any mention of this in the King James continue and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between the word of the Lord and every living soul of all flesh that is upon the earth And the Lord said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have covenanted between my word and between the word for all flesh that is upon the earth. And so it's the Father making covenant between he and humanity and all creatures with the Son who would be Savior Messiah. All right, continuing. And you'll see this theme repeated over and over and over. The Father and the Son being one, and that it is through the Word that the Father makes His covenant. And the Word of the Lord was revealed against the city, and with Him seventy angels, having reference to seventy nations, each having its own language, and thence the writing of its own hand. And he dispersed them from thence upon the face 
of all the earth into 70 languages. And one knew not what his neighbor would say, but one slew the other, and they ceased from building the city. And so again, it is Christ, the Logos, Yahushua, the Son of God, which came with 70 of his angels and separated the nations and gave them different languages and gave them different tongues and confounded the efforts of Legion in establishing the New World Order. Continuing. And the word of the Lord sent great plagues against Pharaoh and the men of his house on account of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done to me? Why sayest thou she is my sister? And for those that aren't familiar with the story, it's when Abram declared that Sarah was his sister and both Pharaoh and Abimelech tried to take her as wife on account of her beauty, that the worth of the Lord uh, not only sent plagues, but <laughs> sent an angel to chast chastise both of them. And um, they basically ended up having erectile dysfunction. And not only they, but all of the male males within their kingdom and their wives were unable to bear children or to get pregnant or to give birth. And uh, all this is documented in Scripture. And especially, again, the Targum. All right, continuing. And he brought him forth without and said, Look up now to the heavens and number the stars, if thou art able to number them. And he said, So will be thy sons. And he believed in the Lord and had faith in the memra, the word of the Lord. And he reckoned it to him for righteousness because he parleyed not before him with words. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought thee out of the fiery furnace of the Kazdai to give thee this land to inherit. And so, again, we see that it is the word of the Lord, Christ, that makes covenant with Abraham. All right. This is number 12. And so, you know, being already almost halfway done with the show, there's no way I'll make it through all these instances. But I'll share what I can and I'll do a follow-up because I want you to have all of them. So you can understand and, you know, recognize the deeper relationships of the Israelites and the ancient patriarchs with the Memra, the Logos, the Word of the Father. Jerusalem. And Hagar gave thanks and prayed in the name of the Word of the Lord who had been manifested to her, saying, Blessed be thou, Eloha, the living one of all ages, who has looked upon my affliction. For she said, Behold, thou art manifested also unto me, even as thou was manifested to Sarah, my mistress. And so here Hagar is telling us that the word of the Lord had gone and saved her in her desperation in the desert that, you know, she was watching Ishmael die of thirst and that she recognized also that it was the word of the Lord, 
Christ, which had aided Sarah in the same manner that he is aiding Hagar and the son, Ishmael. All right, continuing. The first angel was sent to announce to our father Abraham that, behold, Sarah would bear Itzak. The second angel was sent to deliver Lot from the midst of the overthrow. The third angel was sent to overthrow Saddam and Amora, Adma and Zeboim. Therefore was there a word of prophecy from before the Lord unto Abraham the just. And the word of the Lord was revealed to him in the valley of vision. And he sat in the door of the tabernacle comforting himself from his circumcision in the fervor or strength of the day. And he said, I beseech by the mercies that are before thee, O Lord, if now I have found favor before thee, that the glory of thy Shechaniah may not now ascend from thy servant, until I have set forth provisions under the tree, and I will bring food of bread, that you may strengthen your hearts and give thanks in the name of the word of the Lord. And afterwards, pass on. And so, again, Abraham gives thanks to the word of the Lord, who is his helper. I've got enough for probably two more. I mean, time enough. The next one, number 14. And the word of the Lord had caused showers of favor to descend upon Saddam and Amorah to the intent that they might work repentance but they did it not. So that they said, Wickedness is not manifest before the Lord. Behold, then there are now sent down upon them sulfur and fire from before the word of the Lord from heaven, Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord himself had made to descend upon the people of Saddam and Amorah showers of favor that they might work repentance from their wicked works. And so we see again, you know, that uh, working and speaking with Abraham, that the word of the Lord had agreed to spare the city if they would just repent, but they would not. All right, the last one before break. And the word of the Lord said to him in a dream, Before me also it is manifest that in the truthfulness of thy heart thou didst this, and so restrained I thee from sinning before me. Therefore I would not permit thee to come near her, and now let the wife of the man return, for he is a prophet. He will pray for thee, and thou shalt live. But if thou wilt not let her return, know that dying thou shalt die, thou and all who are thine. And again, this was as it had occurred to Pharaoh that Abraham declared Sarah, his sister, that Abimelech also took her and had intention of wedding her and making her one of his wives. And just as the word of the Lord and the angels had gone forth and chastised Pharaoh, so did they do so to Abimelech and to all his people. And that the word of the Lord went to Abimelech in a dream and informed him that Sarah was the wife of Abraham. 
and that he was a prophet and that he would pray for Abimelech and that he and his people would have their their ED removed. Okay, one, uh, actually, no, we won't have time. So I'll pick it up there when we return. But um, I hope you are enjoying this study. I think it will greatly bless you to understand the full context of the story and to see, you know, how much and how intimate the relationships of Israel and the early patriarchs with Christ, the Logos, was. I mean, really fantastic study. And this is something that nobody else is speaking about because nobody studies the Targum, uh, at least in in the manner that I have and I've been doing shows on this now for several years. So we'll be right back for a second hour. I'm going to continue on, but thank you again for joining us this evening. And uh, for those that are just tuning in or are new to the show, I am your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio on Studio B at freedomslips.com. Good to hear all of you as well. All right, we're going to continue with this particular study, and we made it through 16 instances of the specific passages where, you know, the word of the Lord has been removed from Scripture. And I did not finish the previous verse, so I'll just read it in its fullness. It says, And the word of the Lord said to him in a dream before me also it is manifest that in the truthfulness of thy heart thou didst this and so restrained I thee from sinning before me. Therefore I would not permit thee to come near her and now let the wife of the man return for he is a prophet. He will pray for thee that thou shalt live, but if thou wilt not hear her, let her return. Know that dying thou shalt die, thou and all who art thine. And then Abraham prayed before the Lord, and the Lord healed Abimelech and his wife and his concubines, and they were set at large. For the word of the Lord shutting had shut in displeasure the wombs of all the women of Abimelech's house on account of Sarah, the wife of Abraham. And so we see how Abimelech released Sarah and also gave much treasure, cattle, and goods to Abraham and to Sarah in the same way that Pharaoh had given even his daughter Hagar to be a handmaiden to Sarah, that she was a princess, you know, the fated to later be queen possibly. And yet in the story he says to her, you know, better to be a handmaiden to Sarah, who's the wife of this prophet, this great prophet, than to, you know, be, um, you know, a princess in the kingdom, in his kingdom, which shows how much he revered Abraham as a holy man. All right, continuing. Arise, support the child and strengthen thy hand in him, for I have set him for a great people. And the Lord opened her eyes and showed her a well of water. And she went and filled the cruis with water and gave the youth to drink. And the word of the Lord was the helper of the youth. 
And he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became a skillful master of the bow. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Faran and took for a wife Adisha, but put her away. And his mother took for him Fatima to wife from the land of Mizraim. This, of course, we're speaking about Ishmael. And it was at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, chief of his host, spake to Abraham, saying, The word of the Lord is in thine aid in all whatsoever thou doest. And now swear to me here by the word of the Lord that thou wilt not be false with me, nor with my son, nor with the son of my son, according to the kindness which I have done with thee. Thou shalt do with me and with the land in which thou dwellest. And so here Abimelech and Phicol, the chiefs of the kingdoms, there where uh, Abraham would dwell, that they recognize that the word of the Lord was Abraham's helper and that the word of the Lord had come to aid him in whatsoever thou doest. And so then they make a pact, a covenant with Abraham in the name of the word of the Lord. So, I mean, it shows again that Abraham knew Christ as Savior Messiah, as did those that you know, just even knew about him, that he was a follower and a worshiper and gave reverence and found aid in Christ as Logos, as the word of the Lord. So it's undeniable that, you know, the Hebrews, which Abraham was the father of the Hebrews, that they had relationship with Christ before he incarnated into flesh as the child of the Virgin Mary. That was just a later incarnation and a prophecy that would be fulfilled by him. And they knew of this as well. So we'll continue. And Abimelech and Phicol, the chief of his host, arose and returned to the land uh, the Philistine, and he planted a garden, a paradise, at the well of the seven lambs, and prepared in the midst of it food and drink for them who passed by and who returned. And he preached to them there, Confess ye and believe in the name of the word of the Lord, the everlasting God. I mean, come on. Who's going to deny that Abraham revered Christ as the Son of God, as the Logos? I mean, it's all throughout scriptures, in the ancient scriptures, the account of ancient scriptures. And there's confirming witness to this as well. You can read in a book that we have out called The Writings of Abraham, which I'm about to do an update, and I will be including within the publication of that text, an ancient manuscript called the Book of the Order of the Ancients, which you cannot find in print right now. And we've been asked to release it numerous times, and so I'm just going to make it a part of that particular text, that particular book, because in the writings of Abraham, you have this same thing being repeated from a completely different source that Abraham revered and had relationship with Christ as the Logos. And also that um, in the same manner as many of these stories that are found in the Targum, you will find them repeated in the writings of Abraham. And it shows how Abraham was taught by, was led by an angel 
from out of Babylon to he was taken to where uh, Noah and Shem lived together. And he was raised there from the time he was 13 until he was 37 years old, that he was raised in the order of the ancients, in the church of the firstborn, and became a prophet in the order of Melchizedek, which the book of the order of the ancients speaks about this ancient, um, this church, this ancient church and this ancient way of being that the prophets and the Levitical priesthood were brought up in. And so Abraham was the high priest after Shem and after Noah. Okay, continuing. Jerusalem. And Abraham planted a paradise in Beersheba and prepared in the midst of it food and drink for those who arrived at the border. And they ate and drank and sought to give him the price of what they had eaten and drunk. But he willed not to receive it from them. But our father Abraham discoursed to them of that which he had said, that the world was by his word. Pray before your father who is in heaven, from whose bounty you have eaten and drunk. And they stirred not from their place until the time when he had made them proselytes and had taught them the way of everlasting. And Abraham praised and prayed there in the name of the word of the Lord, the God of eternity. All right, 19th instance. Behold, now today I am 30 and 6 years old, and if the Holy One, blessed be He, were to require all my members, I would not delay. These words were heard before the Lord of the world, and the word of the Lord at once tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold me. See, um, what a lot of people don't realize is that Isaac, in speaking with Ishmael, Ishmael was talking about how he had given because he became circumcised later in his life when he was 13 years old. And he began to brag about how he had given his foreskin and in worship and reverence to the word of the Lord. And then Isaac, he, well, actually, um, he was younger. And it was, I think he was like eight or nine when, um, when Ishmael made this boast. And then he said to him that even if God required his life, that he would give it. And so that's why the story of Abraham being asked to sacrifice Isaac, it came about later. And it was because of that boast. And it was also prophetically connected to what the father would do for us himself in sending his only begotten son into the world to dying on the cross, redeem us as the Passover lamb, the lamb without spot or blemish, whose blood became an atoning gift of redeem, redemption and sacrifice. All right, continuing. Jerusalem. And Abraham said, The word of the Lord will prepare for me a lamb. And if not, then thou art the offering, my son. And they went, both of them, together with a contrite heart. And so the, here's another aspect of the story that people don't know about in reading only the King James. That Isaac knew because of his boast that 
um, that his life was going, that he would be the sacrifice. That, and he even encouraged his father to bind him tightly so that he could not struggle against him because he was willing, he was wanting to give his, even his life to be sacrificed for his belief and for his commitment to his faith and to his trust in the Lord. But the word of the Lord made a different way. And we know that a lamb, which had been created even before the foundations of the earth, that he was found caught up in the thickets. And that it was this ram that Abraham had sacrificed. And that the shofar, um, the first shofar was made from this ram's horn. And it would be this this ram's horn that the angel would blow at the seventh trumpet at the end of days. Because that is also told in the story. So you get a lot of detail which is excluded when you read the Targum. Which is why I recommend that people check it out, read and study it for yourself. Oh, here's another thing as well, that the altar which Abraham had taken Isaac to, it was the altar which was established initially for Passover by Adam. It was the same altar which Cain and Abel made their first fruits offering to the Most High God. And Cain's offering was not accepted, but... Abel's was and that it was this same altar that Noah after the great flood the deluge that when he landed back near the holy land that it was this altar which he rebuilt and made offerings to the most high God when he was brought back to the safety of the land and that it drying enough that he then, you know, planted a vineyard. And it was this same altar which Abraham used in offering Isaac as sacrifice. And all of that can be gleaned from reading the Targum. As well as others, you know, when you read the other ancient commentaries, they also confirm this story in the same way that I just revealed it to you. All right, continuing. And Abraham prayed in the name of the word of the Lord and said, Thou art the Lord who seest and art not seen. I pray for mercy before thee, O Lord. It is wholly manifest and known before thee that in my heart there was no dividing in the time that thou didst command me to offer Isaac my son, and to make him dust and ashes before thee. But that forthwith I arose in the morning, and performed thy word with joy, and I have fulfilled thy word. Because, you know, he stopped Abraham. Abraham was, and so was Isaac. They were prepared to carry out the command and the trial and the test that uh, was brought before him. And again, uh, for those that don't understand the fullness of the story, it was because of Isaac's boast that this challenge was brought upon them. It wasn't just, you know, God being cruel and uh, incompassionate, but you know, again, like with the story of Job, that Job was destroying the altars, the high places of Satan, and that God had went to him and told him, Job, Satan's going to target you if you keep doing these things. And Job said, you know, but God said to him that if you continue and you stand for truth and you 
persevere, I will reward you double. And he was, you know, basically like, bring it on. And so that's when Satan went after him. And you can read that in a book called The Testament of Job, where it describes him destroying all the groves and the high places before Satan, you know, began to target him. And that God had went to him in warning to, you know, to give him the heads up as to what was coming. Which when you understand the these hidden aspects of the story, it, it brings to light really uh, the compassion and the just and the lovingness of our Creator. Which has, for whatever reason, been left out in context of some of the stories. All right, continue. 22nd instance. And Abraham was old with days, and the word of the Lord had blessed Abraham with every kind of blessing. And Abraham said to Eleazar, his servant, the senior of his house, who had rule over all his property, put now thy hand upon the section of my circumcision. This was above his knee, and we covered this in great detail as well. Um, Jerusalem, and Abraham said to his servant, the ruler who had ruler rule over thee, all that was his, put now thy hand under the thigh of my covenant. And swear to me in the name of the word of the Lord God, whose habitation is in heaven on high, the God whose dominion is over the earth, that thou wilt not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou wilt go to the land and the house of my kindred and take a wife for my son for its sake. And that's when Eleazar was sent to Laban. Continuing. And they answered, Seeing we have seen that the word of the Lord is for thy help, and for thy righteousness' sake all good hath been to us. But when thou wentest forth from our land, the wells dried up, and our trees made no fruit, then we said, we will cause him to return to us. And that happened when Itzhak went forth, as well as Abraham, and as well as um, uh, Miriam's well dried up in the land, you know, where, uh, where God, where Moshe tapped the rock, uh, and that the, the waters burst forth. That when Miriam passed away, this why this well dried up as well. And so there's many times that because of the presence of Abraham or Isaac or, uh, you know, of Jacob, that the wells overflowed and that all benefited and prospered from the blessings that Yahuwah had poured out upon uh, the patriarchs through the Abrahamic covenant. All right, continue. Therefore, the word of the Lord give thee of the good news which descend from the heaven. Uh, Give thee of the good dews which descend from the heavens and of the good fountains that spring up and make the herbage of the earth to grow from beneath and plenty of provision and wine. Let people be subject to thee, all the sons of Esau, and kingdoms bend before thee, all the sons of Keturah. A chief and a ruler be thou over thy brethren, and let the sons of thy mother salute thee. Let them who curse thee, my son, be accursed as Biliam 
Bar Beor, and them who bless thee be blessed as Moshe, the prophet, the scribe of Israel. Jerusalem. Let people serve before thee all the sons of Esau. All kings be subject to thee, all the sons of Ishmael. Be thou a chief and a ruler over the sons of Keturah. All the sons of Laban, the brother of thy mother, shall come before thee and salute thee. Whoso curseth thee, Jacob, my son, shall be accursed as Balaam ben Biar. And whoso blesseth thee shall be blessed as Moshe, the prophet and scribe of Israel. And it was when Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had only gone out about two handbreadths from Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And the word of the Lord had impeded him from taking clean venison, but he had found a certain dog and killed him and made food of him and brought to his father and said to his father, Arise, my father, and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And so you see here that um, Esau tried to trick his father and was going to feed him a dog. I mean, that's pretty low down. Um, even though, you know, well, we don't eat dog in this culture, but I know they do in other places. But still, I think the meaning of this story uh, comes forth in new light when you consider it from the Targum. And that it was the word of the Lord that had impeded Esau, you know, working for the favor of Jacob. All right, continuing. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if the word of the Lord will be my helper and will keep me from shedding innocent blood and from strange worship and from impure converse in this way that I am going and will give me bread to eat and raiment to wear and will bring me back in peace to my father's house, the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be ordained for the house of the sanctuary of the Lord. And upon it shall generations worship the name of the Lord. And of all that thou mayest give me, the tenth will I separate before thee. And so you see here again that Jacob renews as Abraham had his covenant with the word of the Lord. All right, continue. And Jacob kissed Rahel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told unto Rahel that he was come to be with her father to take one of his daughters. And Rahel answered him, Thou canst not dwell with him, for he is a man of cunning. And Jacob said to her, I am more cunning and wiser than he, nor can he do me evil, because the word of the Lord is my helper. And here's another side of the story that a lot of people don't understand, is that Laban had, um, he had plotted the murder of Jacob that he wanted to steal all of the cattle, which, you know, Jacob ended up taking, and that um, he was also serving strange gods. He was much like what we would consider a Satanist or a Luciferian, a pagan um, today. But again, because the word of the Lord, Christ is the helper and the protector of Jacob, as he will be for Joseph, and on and on and on, as he was for Abraham, 
as he was from for Adam, for Shem, for Noah, for Enoch. You know, these stories just continue to repeat. And it's only with understanding in the manner that we're covering it now that one will be able to truly make sense of the bigger picture. And next. And Elohim remembered Rahel. And the word of the Lord remembered Rahel in his good compassions. And the word of the Lord heard the voice of her prayer. And he said in his word that he would give her children. Remember that Rahel was barren in the same manner that Hannah, Mary's mother, and Samuel, Samuel and um, also of, what am I thinking? Oh, Sarah, Abraham's wife that Sarah was barren as well. And so was Hannah, uh, the wife of Joachim, which was the father and mother of the Virgin Mary. And also Samuel, the prophet Samuel, his parents, uh, his mother was barren. All right, continuing. And Jacob said to his sons, whom he called his brethren, Collect stones, and they collected stones and made a mound, and they ate upon the mound, and Laban called it Ogar, Sahid, but Jacob called it the holy, in the holy tongue, Gal Ed, and the observatory also it was called, because he said, The Lord shall observe between me and thee. When we are hidden, each man from his neighbor, if thou shalt afflict my daughters, doing them injury, and if thou take upon my daughters, there is no man to judge us. The word of the Lord seeing is the witness between me and thee. This is Laban speaking, um, you know, that he made a pact once he caught up with Jacob. Uh, and Jacob had gone forth with his cattle and left by night. And um, then Laban caught up because his gods were missing and Rahel had them and had hidden them, uh, but claimed that she was, you know, menstruating and so was not asked to s- sit up or to leave. Her ride. All right, continuing. We are covering quite a lot, and we're on 21, 29 now, so. Jerusalem. And Deborah, the nurse of Rebekah, died and was buried below Bethel under an oak, and he called the name of it the Oak of Weeping, the God of Eternity, whose name be blessed forever and ever, hath taught us precepts which are beautiful and statutes that are comely. He hath taught us the blessing of matrimony from Adam and his bride, as the scripture expoundeth. And the word of the Lord blessed them. And the word of the Lord said to them, Be strong and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. He hath taught us to visit the afflicted from our father Abraham, the righteous, when he revealeth himself to him in the plain of vision and gave him the precept of circumcision and made him to sit in the door of his tent in the heat of the day as the scripture expoundeth and saith, and the word of the Lord revealed himself to him in the plain of vision. And again, he hath taught us to bless those who mourn from our father Jacob the righteous, for he revealed himself to him on his coming from Padan Aram, when the way of the world had happened to Deborah, 
the nurse of Rebekah, his mother, and Rahel died by him in the way. And Jacob, our father, sat weeping and bewailing her and mourning and crying. Then wast thou, O Lord of all worlds, in the perfection of thy free mercies revealed to him, and didst comfort him, and blessing the mourners didst bless him concerning his mother, even as the scripture expoundeth and saith, The word of the Lord revealed himself unto Jacob the second time on his coming from Padan Aram and blessed him. All right, just a few more. And in that hour, the word of the Lord heard the voice of her supplication and said to Michael, Descend and let her eyes have light. When she saw them, she took them and cast them before the feet of the judges, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. Uh, this is speaking about um, Judah. Um, what's the lady's name? That she acted as a prostitute. Why can I not remember her name? Anyways, you know who I'm talking about. They had seven, seven husbands. Okay. Um, let me read the story again. In that hour, the word of the Lord heard the voice of her supplication and said to Michael, descend and let her eyes have light. When she saw them, she took them and cast them before the feet of the judges, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. But thou, but though I may be burned, I declare him not, but confined in the ruler of all the world, the Lord, who is witness between me and him, that he will give to the heart of the man to whom these belong, to acknowledge whose are these, his ring and mantle and staff. And so, you know, that was, uh, God, I can't remember. If somebody remembers, can you state it in the chat room? I can't remember her name for whatever reason. Bilma. Is it Bilma? No, it wasn't Bilma. That was the concubine that Reuben had taken to wife of his father's concubine. All right, but anyways, we'll continue. All right, 31. But Joseph was brought down into Mizraim, and Potiphar a man of Mizraim, a chief of Pharaoh, a chief of the executioners, bought him with the pledges of the Arabians who had brought him down thither. And the word of the Lord was Joseph's helper. And he became a prosperous man in the house of his Mizraite master. And his master saw that the word of the Lord was his helper and that the Lord prospered in his hand all that he did. And Joseph found favor in his eyes and he served him and he appointed him superintendent over his house and all that he had he delivered into his hands. Jerusalem And he delivered in his hands and appointed him superintendent. So now we've reached all the way to Joseph. Which we know that Joseph, after Isaac and Jacob, that he was the favorite and that he received dream 
and that he would be the one to save not only the Israelites, but all of the peoples uh, through his appointment in Egypt. All right, continuing. Jerusalem. Joseph left the mercy above and the mercy beneath and the mercy which accompanied him from his father's house and put his confidence in the chief butler. He trusted in the flesh and the flesh he tasted of even the cup of death. Neither did he remember the scripture where it is written expressly, Cursed shall be the man who trusteth in the flesh and setteth the flesh as his confidence. Blessed shall be the man who trusteth in the name of the word of the Lord and whose confidence is the word of the Lord. Therefore, the chief butler did not remember Joseph but forget him until the time of the end came that he should be released. 34. It was at the end of two years that the remembrance of Joseph came before the word of the Lord. And Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, from the river came up seven oxen, good-looking and fat-fleshed, and they grazed in the midst of the sedges. 35. And Israel looked at the sons of Joseph and said, From whom are these born to thee? And Joseph answered his father, They are my sons, which the word of the Lord gave me, according to this writing, according to which I took Asenath, the daughter of Dinah, thy daughter, to be my wife. Uh, Here's another aspect of the story that few people know about that Hamor who was the prince of Shechem that when the Israelites moved into uh, Haran around that area that everybody you know wanted to make a pact with them and to incorporate them into their their bloodline. And Hamor raped Dinah. And Dinah had a little girl and her name was known as Asenath. And if you really look at and examine the story, Asenath, who was... um adopted by the high priest of Pharaoh, that she later became a Joseph's wife. And she was an Israelite. She was a Hebrew. But she was raised in the belief and the worship of idols. And that's why when she, if you read the story of Joseph and Asenath, which is, one of the most beautiful love stories and scriptural, um, you know, romances to be read anywhere. But anyways, um, that when she renounced idols and put on sackcloth and cried and prayed and came to know the Most High God, that God redeemed her healed her, and made her worthy to be a wife unto Joseph. And so that's how, you know, Joseph's wife was a perfect fit for him, being the daughter of Dinah. All right, continuing. 36. And Israel said to Joseph, Behold, my end cometh to die, but the word of the Lord shall be your helper 
and restore to you to the land of your fathers. And I, behold, I have given to thee the city of Shechem, one portion for a gift above thy brethren, which I took from the hand of the Amorite at the time that you went into the midst of it. And I arose and helped you with my sword and with my bow, Jerusalem. And I, behold, I have given thee one portion above thy brethren, the robe of the first Adam, Abraham, the father of my father, took it from the hand of Nimrod, the wicked, and gave it to Itzak, my father. And Itzak, my father, gave it to Esau. And I took it from the hands of Esau, my brother, not with my sword nor with my bow, but through my righteous and my good works. Um, for those that don't know the story of the garments of power, as well as the rod of wonders, I am currently working on a book to tell that story. And it's quotes like here from the Targum that we see mentioned in passing how Jacob gave to Joseph the robe of many colors, that it was the robe of Adam and that, you know, Abraham had gotten it from Nimrod, the wicked. Well, in some stories it says that, you know, Abraham received it. In other stories it says that Esau took it from Nimrod, killed him, and that uh, then he gave it to Jacob when he bartered for the porridge and gave up his birthright. And that Jacob also received the robe of the many color that was given to Joseph. Anyways, it's a fascinating story and one that I will reveal in greater clarity. And hopefully, if I get time, maybe half a year and I should have it out to all of you. All right, the last one. We'll end here. But he returned to abide in his early strength and would not yield himself unto sin and subdued by his inclinations by the strong discipline he had received from Jacob and thence became worthy of being a ruler and of being joined in the engraving of the names upon the stones of Israel. From the word of the Lord shall be thy help. And he who is called the all-sufficient shall bless thee with the blessings which descend with the dew of heaven from above and with the good blessing of the fountains of the deep which ascend and clothe the herbage from beneath. And so, again, you can see all these numerous instances where the word of the Lord is cited as being the helper and even of making covenant between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And it will continue. Uh, when we pick it up in part two, you'll see how it is that Moshe and also that the word of the Lord Christ had great part to play in the plagues uh, and even the slaughter of the firstborn, as I read in the opening passage of this particular show. And so, again, when you have this understanding, it reveals in great detail how it is that the Israelites, the Hebrews, the people of Yasharel, how they were worshipers of the Godhead, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even though, you know, the Holy Spirit is uh, not mentioned greatly in some of these stories, 
when you read like the Wisdom of Solomon and the apocryphal books, you'll see that she too was very instrumental in relationship with the patriarchs of old. Um, but again, you know, some of this remains hidden, uh, but we are bringing it to light and helping you to understand so that you can, in my opinion, understand the proper context of whom we should be honoring, worshiping, and giving reverence to. That it's not just the Father and the Son, but the Holy Spirit as the feminine aspect of the Godhead. That we should give equal reverence and consideration and thanksgiving and gratitude to all of them for manifesting all things. Because it was they together as one, three in one, try, meaning three, unity, meaning one, trinity. All right. Till next time, God bless all. Of you.